This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to Roots and All. I stumbled across a book called The Human Newer Handbook, shit in a nutshell, and of course, I had to buy a copy. I've long thought that if we're aiming towards a closed system within our gardens, then our own waste needs to be factored into the equation. So I was intrigued to find out what the book's author, Joseph C. Jenkins, had to say on the matter. What I didn't expect was the book to be one of those that slaps you in the face with facts and makes you question the whole way you've lived your life, in this case in relation to loos and their contents. Not only does Joe comprehensively explain how you can take the contents of your loo and compost it, along with your garden waste, so that you can have a clean and useful product that can be used on everything from vegetables to houseplants, he will make you wonder why you ever thought the alternative of flushing it away was a sensible, viable option. There's so much I wanted to cover with Joe, and we only scratched the surface of the subject in this interview. I urge you to get the book and think about the issue of how we deal with waste. It's a vitally important environmental issue. Here's Joe talking about how he came to be interested in off-grid toilets. You know, when I came here, I've been here now 42 years this was my actually my forty third year. I didn't have any money, you know. I was I, literally I had uh, seven hundred dollars to my name. I had an old pickup truck and some old tools I bought in auctions, you know, and yard sales. And some people offered me seven acres back in the woods. I mean, it was a quarter mile. My driveway was a quarter mile long. There was no driveway then. And I so I took it, you know. And they they let me pay it off over a few years. Uh, it was cheap back then, five hundred dollars an acre. So even though I have you know one hundred and forty three acres uh, now, I started with nothing. So it's not like I inherited anything or you know won any uh, lotteries or anything like that. I just worked all the time, and uh, you know now that's the way it goes in life. And the more you the harder you work, the better you get at what you do, the more rewards you receive. You know for the work that you do and um a lot of people have nothing you know they're they're just like i was 43 years ago you know what thinking what are they going to do how they're going to get a garden how they're going to get land how they're going to get a house you know you, you have to just you start out and eventually you get there you know so what came first your your inheritance or your your coming to that property and needing to you know find a way to live on the land or your interest in I'm going to say composting toilets, and I think you might correct me further down the line. Um, but yeah, what what came first? The the fact that you had to live on the land sustainably, or you were interested in that, or your interest in how we manage our waste? Well, first, let me say uh, the 143 acres is 58 hectares. So does that make do you guys use hectares over there? We use both acres and hectares. Uh, okay. Probably acres probably makes more sense to people. Actually, it's more commonly used. All right. Well, that's good because a lot of times I tell people acres, they they just draw a blank. You know, it's not metric. Um, anyway, it was uh, the uh, the composting came after the gardening. What happened was a couple of things happened that steered me in this direction. Uh, one was I was in college as a pre-med student, and that was during the Vietnam War. It was in the middle of the Vietnam War, and I kind of got fed up with everything. You know, the, the, the whole war was insanity, and I dropped out my last semester, my senior year. I dropped out of college, but I had enough credits to get a degree, so they just, they sent me, I still got, I still got a degree, a bachelor's degree, and in science. But when I got out of college, I realized in four years, I didn't learn anything about health. Nothing. I mean, not a sentence, not a word in any course that I took in four years of pre-med, nothing about health, biology, about chemistry, physics, you know, but nothing about health. And that's really what, what I was interested in. So when I got out of college, I started reading books about health. And, and that's when I learned that food, what you eat, makes all the difference in the world. You know, you are what you eat sort of thing, you know. Uh, uh, 
and I didn't know that. Nobody told me. My parents weren't very good at diet and nutrition. Uh, didn't learn anything in college. And when I started to to realize how important diet was to health, then I changed my diet. You know, uh, and and then I then I got interested in food, and then I got interested in growing food. That coupled with the fact that. I I took a vow of poverty. That was back in 1974 because of the Vietnam War. I didn't want to earn enough money to pay federal income tax because it, the federal income tax was funding the war. So I I decided I'm just going to live in the poverty level. You know, you don't you know, really uh, poverty level. You, you can still earn money. You just you know. Before you start paying federal income tax, you have to earn a certain amount. So I decided I chose to stay below that level. And um, so one of the one of the things I had to do was grow my food. It was part of the self sufficiency practice that I was undertaking. And uh, I was offered this land, and I put up a TP and moved into it. And then I tore down an old house old farmhouse and built a cabin out of it. So I paid up $125 for the house. And, you know, and then I just started like that. I'm still living in, you know, same thing that the cabin now is my kitchen. But that's, that got me out in the country, got me out planting a garden and uh, got me thinking about soil fertility because that's really the basis of gardening. If you don't have Soil fertility, you don't have a garden. And uh, plus, I was off the grid, no electricity, uh, never really no running water. I had a hand pump for water, and I carried drinking water from a spring out back. So then, you know, what do you do for a toilet? And I had enough education to know about environmental issues, you know, sewage pollution, uh, health problems with. Uh, fecal contamination in the environment, that sort of thing. But I also knew that there was soil fertility coming out of my body that I should be recycling. And uh, so that's what, that's what got me into the compost toilets. I, 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 recyc I recycled uh, all the toilet material ever produced on this property in 43 years has been recycled and put back in the soil. Yeah, I mean, I think probably a lot of people think that the a flushing toilet is the holy grail of comfort and civilized living. But actually reading your book, I think I got the impression that actually that is completely wrong. It's it's a completely wrong ideal. Well, to give you an example, I'm in my office, right? It's just in my house. I have, a, uh, I have another building up over the hill uh, about a quarter mile away that's my main office. I've, actually, there's three or four offices in that building, but in my house, I have a small office, and it's uh, about eight feet wide and ten feet long. Is that that's the size of it? Um, one person office, and uh, I have a compost toilet in here. Uh, I can almost reach over and touch it. It's that close. You never. There's never any odor from it at all. Nobody would ever know there's a toilet in this room, but there is. And, um, you know, I drink coffee. I'm, I work at my computer. Uh, I, I mean, it's everybody knows that you're going to have to um, visit a toilet throughout the day, especially if you're drinking, uh, drinking or eating. And um, it's so convenient to have a toilet in the same room where you work. Uh, you can't do that with flush toilets. You can't put them anywhere you want them. You have to put them wherever the pipes are and the drains and all that. A compost toilet, you can put it anywhere next to your bed. You know, if you're if you're bedridden, um, you can put it in your barn or your garage or your shop, upstairs, downstairs. You know, I have actually have uh, three in this house, three compost toilets, one downstairs, one in the other bedroom, uh, the guest bedroom, and I have one out in uh, of another building here where it has sort of an apartment, so I have a compost toilet out there, and I have two in my in my main office and then one up and up we have a lake here so there's one up at the lake so um and everything i collected and composted it's not a big deal um and then all that compost ends up back in the in the soil when it's finished 
reading your book, it really does challenge a lot of stuff that we think of, particularly in the West, as taboo. Uh, and I think probably will, people will be listening and, and just going <gasps> at the thought of having a loo in their office because it is so revolutionary. But your book is so convincing that actually it, it does shake up every notion I've ever held about the way we manage waste in a really positive way because it, it and it gives the solutions to these problems. So if I had, say, a, a, sometimes in the UK we might have uh, an allotment or there might be an outdoor site where people would think of having a loo that would compost, you know, the waste. Um, but what we do generally here, I think, is we probably have what is like a separating system. So we will filter out the urine from the faecal matter and then we will keep them separately. And in your book, you don't, necessarily advocate for doing that can you explain why uh you know it, it took me a long time to figure that out because because when i when i first bumped into that concept about separating urine i was just astonished that anybody would do that because i had already been composting by then for 20 years maybe longer and never separated any urine never, i mean that, just the idea of it is preposterous to me uh it wasn't until i went to Finland to the dry toilet conference uh, the first time that I started to realize that there's this whole phenomenon of dry toilets, which are not compost toilets. Uh, the dry toilet is, you know, you, you separate the urine you, to keep the contents of the toilet dry. And uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, none of which make any sense if you're composting. So that that's what this urine separation is all about, about the dry toilets. and that's not what I do at all. I don't do the dry toilets. I do the compost toilets. A compost toilet is where you collect everything, feed it to a compost pile, and then allow it to compost. So it's a completely different, completely different system. But like I say, it took me a long time to figure out, like, what the hell are they doing? Uh, the first time I went to dry toilet conference in Finland, and I've been there four times, and I've spoke all four times. I was a speaker. The first time I went, you know, it's academic. It's an academic conference. You submit a paper and all that. The first time I spoke, after I spoke, people came down to the stage and begged me to separate urine. Try it, they said. Just try it. And I'm like, why would I do that? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. It just complicates everything. And the system that I use is extremely simple. Anybody can do it. To have people separating the urine when they're using the toilet, to me, is is crazy. But they weren't composting. They weren't making compost. They knew nothing about compost. They didn't even know anything. Uh, so I realized that had to be my focus, was teaching people what composting was and how it worked and what the difference is between the dry toilet and a compost toilet. So that's just, I don't know which edition of my book you have. Is it? The fourth edition, that's what it should be. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, that And I get into that topic in, in that book. Uh, I try to um, clarify the, those concepts between dry toilets and compost toilets. But, um, you know, I look out, out the window here, and it's white, you know, with snow and ice. Uh, all the trees, branches, and everything are covered with ice. And uh, if I drink coffee or something, I have to use the toilet, toilet's right by the window. I look out the window and I, it reminds me when I went to Mongolia. You know, I did some consulting work there about compost toilets. And um, the ladies there, the ladies there were in the offices and stuff, you know, all dressed up in high heels. And But a lot of their, their offices and stuff didn't have toilets. They had latrines. And so these ladies all dressed up in high heels, would have to go outside to the pit latrine, which is 50 feet or, you know, maybe 50 meters away from the building because they smell bad, and squat over these holes to use a toilet, and there's ice on the floor. So they're trying to not slip on the ice while they're squatting over their pit latrine hole in their high heels and fancy clothes. And I thought, you know... If they just had a compost toilet, it would be so much nicer for them. They'd be inside, it'd be comfortable, warm, they wouldn't have to go out. Uh, nobody would 
smell anything. There wouldn't be any pollution in the ground, like from these people tree. They just don't know. They just don't know that that's an option. Most people around the world never even heard of this concept. It's like something brand new. And when they see how simple it is and how it works, it's like, holy moly, we can have a toilet now inside. doesn't matter if it's, you know, how cold it is or how much snow there is or, or if it's raining or, you know, um, we can have a comfortable toilet inside for the whole family. And I, I just think of those ladies, because when I was over there, I was photographing the latrines, and one lady came out while I was photographing her, and she was all dressed up in high heels, and she just waited for me to finish taking photo- photos, and then she went in, into the pit latrine, and it was cold. It was winter time. I felt I just felt sorry for her. It would have been so much easier for her if they had just put a compost toilet in her office someplace, you know. It could be behind a curtain, you know, it could be. Could be in a closet, pull, pull the stuff out of the closet, stick a toilet in there, you know. Yeah, that does conjure an image, I have to say. I mean, I can't imagine people where I used to work in an office just trotting outside using a pit latrine. I mean, it just is kind of inconceivable. Yeah, and it, it's not, it, it, this, is, this is the other thing, it's not that uncommon. You know, there are, there's, there's, there's still several hundred million people, I think it's something like 800 million people still just open defecate. And there's still billions of people who don't have toilets. So, you know, in the UK or the United States, uh, we just take it for granted. But the United States, we, we only have 4% of the world's population. So there's still 96% of all people live outside the U.S. And Amer- Americans are, don't really know or, or see what, what it's like in a lot of the other countries, Central America, South America, Asia, Africa. There are people that just don't have toilets. They don't have the uh, the infrastructure, you know. Uh, they don't have the water. In the cities, they do, but uh, they, then they still have the huge pollution problems. Rivers, you know, I, I discuss a lot of that in my, uh, my book, the amount of pollution that comes from the sewage system, et cetera. Yes, you do. Um, and it is utterly convincing, as I say, your, your arguments, you know, against using that system on an ongoing basis. Um, so, you know, we do know the problems that are involved with uh, using flushing toilets, with disposing of the waste. And it does seem as we try and move more and more towards kind of operating homes and gardens as a closed loop system, that we do need to retain what we produce inside that site and we need to stop bringing too much extra material in. So in view of that, obviously you're, you talk about composting waste, human waste. I think some objections to that without knowing anything else from people would be, okay, fine, well, if I'm going to compost my human waste, I cannot possibly use that on anything edible, Um, you know, and you do. How have you got over that barrier? Um, Or, or, you know, was there one to start with? Is is using human waste on vegetable crops or, you know, fruit crops a problem? Um, Yeah, it's it's really a an issue um, in flush toilet cultures. This is this is a, a, a concept that I, I, I try to write about in, in my book. Um, when I go to cultures that don't have flush toilets and they see the compost process, there are no qualms about the whole system. They're excited to actually have a, a toilet. Uh, they're not worried about um, the pathogen issue that really they don't know anything about it. But the, the whole point of composting is it eliminates the pathogens. And that, that, that's why, you know, when I started, when I first started this book, uh, it was, it was a graduate thesis and I turned it into a book because when I found out that compost, the composting process eliminates disease organisms, I thought that was fascinating. You know, where do you, where do you hear that? Whoever talks about that, you know, what public health people know anything about compost? Not, composting is not a, a function of public health and it should be because the composting organisms destroy human disease organisms. The compost environment is 
alien to human disease organisms, you know, take polio virus or something like that. Those pathogens are wanting your body. If you put those pathogens in a compost environment, it, they die. And in fact, polio the virus specifically uh, will die rapidly in a compost environment. Uh, everything uh, from uh, parasitic worms, uh, the, the, the microscopic eggs, bacteria, all those things disappear in a compost system. So um, the idea that you shouldn't use the compost because it's not safe is exactly opposite of, of what people should be thinking. Because if you do have pathogens being excreted from your body, ideally, we would have a system to eliminate those from the environment, and composting is that system. Otherwise, people just push the lever on the toilet, flush it out somewhere, and it ends up polluting the rivers, lakes, streams, estuaries, you know, uh, with bacteria and a lot of other things, the drugs that they excrete, you know, um, pharmaceuticals, that, that kind of thing. And those things are, are remediated in compost. The whole, the whole compost uh, phenomenon is, is miraculous, really. And that's why I decided to put it into a book form and publish it rather than just turn it in as, as, as a graduate thesis. Because I, I thought maybe somebody would be interested in reading this. Nobody reads a graduate thesis, you know. I mean, somebody might, but uh, more people are going to are gonna read a book. And uh, I didn't think there'd be much interest, but uh, there, there actually turns out there is. But when we do, you know, travel the world teaching communities about this type of toilet, part of it is, is a lot of it is education. And part of that education is explaining how to make compost so that it's um, hygienically safe. And you did mention drug uh, residues that could be found in the waste. Is that a problem or does composting deal with that to a certain degree as well? Well, yeah, that's. There are, there are certain questions that, that people ask over and over again, and that's one of them. What happens to the pharmaceutical drugs? You know, they say, well, I'm on antibiotics. I'm on this. I'm on that. Can I still use a compost toilet? So I have a whole section on that in this last edition explaining how drugs uh, are remediated or disappear in the compost process. As I try to explain, there's there's not much research available on compost and human manure and, and drugs, you know, drug contamination, pharmaceutical contamination, but there is for animal manure, like uh, dairy cows and that sort of thing. They um, a fair amount of research on you know, what happens when antibiotics in the dairy manure is put through a composting system. And uh, it uh, generally uh, disappears. So you have, you know, a thousand parts per million when you start out. After it's composted, you might have you might have not, nothing detectable, or maybe a, a tiny bit, two parts per million, something like that. So um, it's pretty pretty interesting that that the composting process not only eliminates disease organisms but also cleans out chemical contamination. Yeah, it's really a miraculous process, but it is fundamentally very very simple. But you have to do it right. And if you don't, then I guess that's when you run into problems. Well, the, the worst problem you can have is just is just to leave it sit, you know, for another year. That, that's about the worst thing that can happen. Is you you just have to leave it alone and let it continue to uh, compost for a, 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 a more of a, an extended period of time. Generally, I I recommend the process take a year. Generally. 10 months, 9 months, depending on where you're located, how big your compost pile. I've seen compost piles that are a year old and they're still too hot to even put your hand in them because of the contents and the size. Uh, and then uh, there, there's compost piles that, that don't really heat up much at all, in, in which case um, those compost piles, you would just leave them sit for you know another year before using them in your garden you know the, the main the main thing it's not it's not the uh it's not, it's not disease organisms that's not the main issue about compost it doesn't matter if you're using human manure or any kind of manure 
and, and uh, pharmaceutical drugs. Those are not really important issues. Those things all get cleaned up. The main issue is, is the compost mature enough to go back into the soil? Because if it isn't, it will kill plants. Plants can't live with immature compost. Uh, and the way you determine the maturity of it is if it's, you know, the internal temperature that develops it has to drop back down to ambient temperature or outside temperature. And um, then if you're concerned about the, you know, the compost for whatever reason, then just let it sit for another year. And then if you're still worried about it, don't use it in your garden. You plant trees with it. You know, plant bushes with it. So it's it's really a simple matter to to use the compost. And if if you still uh, don't want to use it, let somebody else have it. I've used all my compost in my garden and in my house plants. When I do a potting mix, I always take a portion of it uh, compost from from my compost pile. I mix compost. I mix garden soil potting mix in equal proportions. And then I uh, throw in some uh, blood meal and bone meal. And that's my standard uh, house, plant, house plant mix. Do you feel confident enough to deal with your own human you? I'd love to know your thoughts on it. It's so easy to flush away the problem, but as the need to be environmentally conscious becomes more and more pressing, is it time we stepped up and became personally responsible for the waste we generate? If you're interested in finding out more, there's a link in the show notes or on my website where you can download the Human Neo Handbook free of charge. There's also a link to where you can purchase a copy if you'd like to support Joe's work. He's also written the Compost Toilet Handbook, which goes into the nuts and bolts of setting up and managing a compost toilet, and I recommend that too if you're thinking of unplumbing from the mains. I'd like to say a very big thank you to Joe for speaking to me for this episode and to you as well for listening. And seeing as this episode is all about taboo topics, here's Dr. Ian Bedford with some more food for thought. Although there's now a world population of 7.8 billion people, it's continuing to grow. And it's forecasted to reach 9 billion in just 30 years' time. However, it's also forecast that to adequately feed 9 billion people, the current rate of food production would have to increase by over 70%. A figure that could be very hard to meet. Since food producers across the globe are already facing difficulties in meeting current demands with a changing climate and diminishing natural resources. So the pressure is on to find and implement new sustainable ways for producing sufficient food for the future and hopefully averting a potential global crisis. New systems that will likely see significant changes to the food we eat and the way it's produced and processed. Systems that require less resources and generate less waste, but increase the yields and nutritional content of food per area of production. Or maybe surprisingly, something that will help solve many of the current and future challenges has already been identified and it's already been tried, tested and approved by almost a quarter of the world's population. Primarily within countries throughout Asia, Africa and Latin America, where people have been eating insects as a staple part of their diet for thousands of years. Insects such as crickets and beetle larvae, which are not only high in nutritious proteins and fat, but have phenomenally high reproduction efficiencies. However, within most Western societies, people haven't yet accepted the concept of invertebrates, such as insects, becoming a regular part of their diet, despite the popularity of eating aquatic invertebrates, such as crab, prawn and lobster. But it is likely to become a reality that in the not too distant future, our diet will include insects, or at least the protein from insects, as food production systems aim to satisfy consumer demand. And some simple facts explain why. Since it requires 10 times less feed 
to produce a kilogram of edible insects than it does to produce a kilogram of beef, lamb or pork within 40 times less space. Emitting a hundred times less greenhouse gases and using 2,000 times less water. And with the vast difference in reproduction rate between insects and farm animals, insect derived food will undoubtedly be cheaper to produce. But even if we really can't accept insects within a Western world diet, they could certainly be given to farm animals as an alternative to feeding them field crops. But before we dismiss eating insects, it's worth knowing that whether we like it or not, we're already well accustomed to eating them, since each of us inadvertently consumes an estimated 140,000 insect body parts each year that have been processed along with the raw ingredients of many of our foods, such as flour, ground coffee, chocolate, and even beer. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.